Welcome, movie fans, to another episode of Hollow Victories, the only fight where bombs are allowed in the ring, and we've got two of the biggest tonight. I'm your host, Matt Presents, joined, as always, by my earthly co-host. Let me tell you who I am, and make no mistake, I'm Mars! There you go, or Mackle, whatever works. Could you understand that? I, I gotcha. I, I, I could hear it pretty clearly. That is uh, Dr. Planet. Um, that was someone who performed at my sister's school when she was like a, a first grader or something. Okay. And I think that is like one of the earliest cases of me enjoying media, ironically, because me <laughs> and my brother would like play that album. Because there's just like there's a rap song about Mercury. That's the hard rock song about Mars. <laughs> It's good okay. stuff. <laughs> I, I was not, I didn't know the reference, so I'm glad you explained it. <laughs> I, I figured it was some, like, rat boy genius thing or something I'd never heard of. <laughs> it's probably more <laughs> obscure than rat boy genius. I, I, it took me forever to fucking find that. <laughs> anyway, uh, as, as our dear friend Mars has so graciously pointed out, today's episode is about two films set on Mars... Both of them are from Disney, and both of them were two of the biggest box office bombs of all time. Yes. Uh, it's Mars Needs Moms versus John Carter. Um, and I guess I'll start us off with Mars Needs Moms. Yeah. So, Mars Needs Moms, a bizarre take on the 60s B-movie Mars Needs Women? Uh, based on a book by, I hope I pronounced this right... Berkeley Breathed, who you might know as the cartoonist behind Get Fuzzy. He's oh, okay. one of the biggest names. No, shit, not Get Fuzzy. Uh, Bloom County. Mm. God damn it. I get those confused sometimes. <laughs> uh, because there's a fucking cat in, in Bloom County, and I, I see him, and I'm like, yeah, Get Fuzzy. And it's like, no, that's, that's a totally different co comic about a different cat. They're not even similar looking cats. Um... Anyways, in the movie, uh, it's about a child, Milo. Did they say how old he is? He's like 9, 10 ish. Yeah, around that age. He's supposed um, to be the same age that Gribble is when he went up. Well, that's not really helpful because we don't know how old Gribble was when he Wasn't went Wasn't he up. like 12 or 11? Something like that? It's whatever. Preteen boy. Mm. Uh, causing trouble for his mother. However, she is a good mother, and because of that, she is abducted by Martians, and Milo only barely manages to stow away on their ship to rescue his mother. Uh, and now it's a, a big adventure on the planet Mars. He meets Gribble, who is a human who lives up there, uh, who, who also went up because they stole his mom. Uh, and this, like, hippie alien who's learned about Earth culture through, like, 60s and 70s media... Um, Key, Key is her name. Yeah. Uh, and uncovers this whole conspiracy around, like, the, the way Martians are being raised. Um, and, and the way they're kidnapping Earth Mothers to program their Mars nanny bots? I, I... I didn't really understand that part. Why are they not having the mothers raise the kids? They're, like... They, they, like, drain the mother's brain and use it to power a robot? That just seemed it's... needlessly dark, honestly. Uh, and it seems like there's, like, five or six too many steps for that to be effective. Yeah, it felt like... But uh... also, also, yeah, it, it definitely implies, like, the mass genocide of Earth mothers yeah. happening on Mars. They don't say it, but, like... Like Gribble's mother's definitely dead, right? Yeah, yeah. They didn't. I, I and I kind of respect them for not copping out of that because I feel like they could have. They could have said, "Oh no, apparently it doesn't destroy them. It takes them here, something like that." Because it's just bullshit. Kids' movies will do stuff like that. Um, but no, because you don't see her body disintegrate. You see something zap her, you know, and then she's gone. Um, but at the same time, it is just kind of like I don't know. It's it's kind of it's kind of weird. <laughs> It's kind of weird to have that in a Disney movie. Like, there's no way to rest. The, the only mother that gets rescued is Milo's. Okay? Yeah. 
Uh, all of the other mothers, they're dead and gone. You just gotta deal with it. Sorry, kids who've had their mothers kidnapped by Martians. So what'd you think? It's definitely one of Disney's, like, less wholesome movies. <laughs> uh, yeah. True enough. <laughs> it's got some likability in some places. I kind of like the kid and Milo and Gribble's dynamic. Uh, Hippie Alien was alright. They all look... Yeah. They're all ugly on the eye. It's not good animation. Oh. It's like... Oh. Absolutely, we're gonna have to talk about the aesthetics of this movie. Yeah. Uh, I, I almost want to say the aesthetics are what killed it, like, at the box office. Like, people looked yeah. at the trailer and were like, nope, pass. They just kind of missed. Um, I think it's worth talking about some of their other, you know, motion capture movies. Uh, I feel like um, bo the other two movies, like, the other two movies that come to mind, I think there might be at least, like, one or two others. Uh, but it's Polar Express and Christmas Carol. Christmas Carol, I think they got, like, really cartoonish with some of the main designs. Like, Ebenezer doesn't look like a real person, so I think it works a little better. And then you have, like, the spirit. So I think a lot of Christmas Carol works, and it's supposed to be a darker and creeper, creepier movie. So I think it's it's still got problems, but it works to the film's benefit in that film. And then Polar Express, I can't deny the uncanniness to it, but I think it at least has some charm to it. That, like, it's a more lighthearted movie. It's a lot more charming. And a lot of, like, the sets, like, like a lot of the sets and backgrounds in the film look really nice. Look really warm. Well, that's the thing, right? Because this killed motion capture movies. You know, like, after this, they're like, okay, we're, we're not doing any more of these. People don't really seem to like them. Like, I, to, to be fair to motion capture, I think it could work in the future. I think it could be a good thing in the future. And I mean, there are even times where it like kind of works, but like you have to put extra effort in to make it work now. Mm -hmm. And they kind of just weren't. That being said, this was like the last motion, like full motion capture movie, at least until some point in the future when we finally try it again. Mm-hmm. And it looks worse than the others. It does. Like, it, it looks worse than Polar Express. It looks worse than uh, Christmas Carol. It looks worse than, what was it, Beowulf? They did a Beowulf movie? Hmm. I'll say this. The one evil alien character, like the one evil woman alien character, like the, I guess the main villain, I thought she looked pretty good because she's supposed to look all disgruntled and ugly. Mm -hmm. I think she's the only one that worked. I think those mole babies look horrifying. They're just like disgusting to look at. And like Gri Gribble is like, the designs for Gribble and the kid are fine, but it's just the expression is always off. Uh, yeah, Gribble looks, like, straight out of Monster House. Oh, yeah, yeah, um, he does look like that, that was, one guy. Was that, was that also motion capture, or was it just... I don't... If it was, they got the facial expressions down much nicer in that movie. Okay. Um, I think it's, it's an aesthetic that kind of works for Monster House, but doesn't really work for this movie. Mm -hmm. Um, I am, like weirdly off put by the aliens design in this movie <laughs> like they're fucking it's it's like it's like they took pixar mom ass and were like how could we make this like really weird so it's it's like just a part of the aliens design that they all have these super wide hips and like a a pretty sizable thigh gap it looks like they took the paintbrush tool and paint and just, I know the eraser tool and paint and just went up. <laughs> yeah, it, it's like, it's like, it seems like it's trying to invoke sexuality, but it just doesn't. <laughs> it's like, it's like the uncanny valley for ass. Yeah, it's, it's very, it's a very bizarre choice. Um, and I don't really, I, I don't know, it... I could see something like that working in like a comedy, you know, where it's like a like a adult comedy where it's like being done as a joke, you know. I couldn't see it working in anything sincere. It's a weird design choice. Yeah, they they do pull off like some good shots in this movie. It's not they do. It's not a total bust visually, but 
Uh, the character I, animation's my big problem with it. I feel like ultimately it is the visuals that, at least at least in part, in in large part, it was the visuals that kept this from being more successful at the box office. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you look at that trailer and it's just immediately like it says everything that you would want, like need to be said when you're seeing a trailer. It's like this looks like shit. Mm-hmm. I don't want to go see this, and it's like. I think some people are a little harsh when they come to saying something looks like shit. Like, and it's like, there there are movies that I don't think look that good that people have gone to see without seeing an issue with the visuals. I think this is one that just struck everyone. Like, everyone who saw it was like, yeah, that's bad. Yeah, I don't want to watch that. Yeah. And uh, to be fair, it's not like horribly ugly. It's, I mean, it's not fucking food fight, but even like, I, I don't like Shark Tale. I would say probably a lot of the characters look worse than the characters in this movie. It just doesn't work. That was my point. Yeah, I was gonna say like it was, even with something like Shark Tale. Yeah, it's an ugly movie, but it's also kind of like consistent. Like everything in that movie looks like it belongs in that movie where Mars needs moms. There are some nice backgrounds, but then there's like weird looking characters moving around it. There's the scene where the main character is like fallen into like the garbage area where all of like the males are sent to and in theory like that could be a really cool scene to watch but he's moving at such a slow pace for some reason um it's just like everywhere in the movie something is off the movement is constantly off the designs of the characters are constantly off um i do think some of the I, like i said this before i do think some of the, i think like backgrounds were fine um i think that most of them look pretty nice um some of them are kind of boring though like i mean a lot of them just kind of feel like shit you've seen in other places I mean, there there were definitely because this came out not too long after Wally, and there was definitely some Wally influence on this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I could see that. Ultimately, like to to bring it back to a positive, I do think I I really like the characters. Right, I mm-hmm. I think Milo is interesting. I think Gribble's really funny. I I like Key. Um, even his mom is pretty nice. The mom is uh, nice. I just think they should have focused on her more. Yeah, she she doesn't get to do a whole lot. Um, but it's it's like okay, you've got all these interesting characters that I like, and I don't know, I just was never super invested in the story in spite of that. Mm-hmm. Like I like I like seeing the characters do things. I like some of their dialogue, some of their banter, but like there was never any point where I was super invested in where the story was going. Yeah, I would agree with that. There was even uh, a particularly good line. I I made sure to make a note of this. <laughs> uh, when when Milo first meets Gribble, he says he's a Seekronaut who was sent up by Reagan in the 80s. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Yeah, no, honestly, I, I laughed a couple of times at this movie. Like, completely unironic laughs, and I, I agree with you. That I, I, I didn't get, like, a ton out of Milo, but I did think Kiki and... Uh... Was is it Kiki or am I adding an extra I, key? I, it's it's just Key, I think. Key and um, Gribble. I thought they were both very likable, actually. Um, and I and I laughed at the. <laughs> it's like this is just okay. This is just a me thing. This is just stupid. But I liked how over the top and stupid the main villain was. Just just making fucking random noises throughout the whole movie. Um, and I like I said, I think it's like the one design that works. She's not like a great villain or anything, but it was just kind of like okay, like. <laughs> It was making me laugh. I got something out of it. <laughs> it well, I mean, she is... It's a bizarre villain story because, like... Yeah. Like, the second it's revealed that, oh, we, here on Mars we used to have families, but we don't do that anymore. Immediately everyone just turns on her, <laughs> specifically. And yeah. it's like... So you're telling me she just said, like, hey, we should do this one day, and everyone just fell in line... <laughs> like <laughs> they have like no they don't think for themselves just one person said hey we should like we should create the society where we abduct mothers and force the males d- down and then they're like yeah okay okay then like a few you know years later someone says hey we should not do this anymore and kill her they're like yeah yeah okay <laughs> like it's just <laughs> yeah this that's just how Martian society is. Every every couple of years, <laughs> someone comes along and is like, "Wait, we should do this," and everyone just, "Okay, yeah, sure, why not?" Opinions are very dangerous on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> I I liked 
that there was romance between Gribble and Key. <laughs> Because, like, uh, Gribble has, like, this alien friend who kind of follows him around through some of the movie. And I thought, okay, maybe they're gonna do, like, Key and Gribble's friend. But then, it, no, it's it's Gribble and Key. And they, they committed to it. And I'm like, thank you. You know? <laughs> yeah. Human on alien action. You Hell don't see yeah. that a lot. He liked that thigh gap. <laughs> um. Yeah, no. I, and I felt, yeah, and I do, I do think that, like... It, it was good. It worked. It's like, they, uh, <laughs> I like when he goes back onto Earth and, like, they're just standing there for a second. He's like, no, I'm going back up. Fuck this. <laughs> <laughs> Who did you say did the voice of Gribble? Because I'm looking at him now, Dan, Dan Fol- Folger. Folger. Who, who else did he, like, you, you mentioned him. Uh, fuck. Hold on. Let's see. Dan Folger. Fol- Fog- Fogler? Oh, Fogler. Balls of Fury. Was it Balls of Fury? Yeah, he was in Balls of Fury. He was in Kung Fu Panda as, like, a more minor character. Uh-huh. But, yeah, he he is one of those actors that tends to show up in a lot of stuff. And so, you, like, if you see his face, you're like, oh, yeah, I know who that is. But he he's a little hard to place. Yeah, that's exactly what I get looking in his face. That's, like, spot on. Um... Do we want to talk about Kasten a bit? Because there's some weird things to mention with Kasten, actually. Yeah, the, there are there are some interesting things going on with the cast. So Milo is physically acted by Seth Green and was initially voiced by Seth Green, but then he was replaced, the voice was replaced by Seth Robert Dusky, which, good call. Yeah. Um, it is, uh, the kid is still, like, credited in the credits, though, by Seth Green. Like, and it's, like, it's an animation. I think you should, the voice is, I know that, like, there's motion capture. I know Seth Green deserves to be credited for his work. But it's, like, I think a voice is the character, you know, I think. Yeah, weirdly, Seth Green was top build, and the actual voice of Milo is, like, way down. Yeah, and they couldn't even make him, like, the second name at the very least. Like, he has to be, he's, like, randomly placed in the middle. It's Milo's voice. That's so weird, seeing that in the credits, that they have to specify he's the one who did the voice in this animated yeah, film. Um, <laughs> well, because they were planning on having Seth Green in it all the way up to, like, the first trailer drops, and they're like, oof, that doesn't work. Yeah. Um, and you can't you can find uh Seth Green's audio track for this movie <laughs> online. Someone dug it up from one of the Blu-ray releases. Um, I I got the movie synced up with the <laughs> Seth Green uh voice track for like uh, three four minutes. I stopped because it was really obvious that the soundtrack was like way turned down on that version, possibly even just like temp tracks and not the actual music in the film. But I'm like, okay, well I want to listen to like the, the correct soundtrack at least, but I don't think Seth Green was that awful as the kid. Uh huh. <laughs> like m- maybe good call, but at the same time, I don't think it makes that much of a difference. Okay. I just think most of the times when you have an adult voice, a kid, it can go poorly. That, that, that with the ec- obvious exceptions, I mean, I think Bob's Burgers and kind of Gravity Falls are great exceptions. Dipper's a little bit uh, jarring at first, but you get used to him. But then, you know, uh, what's her name? Kristen Schwart or something? How do, oh, am I saying that? Is that even remotely right? Uh, Shaw, I believe. Shaw. Kristen Shaw. Yeah, Kristen Shaw. Like, she, she's, like, perfect for voice and, like, kid characters. But just most of the time, it's really weird um, when an adult voice is coming out of a kid a kid character. Yeah. I understand that there's not that many good ch- child actors, but still. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like they maybe could have gotten away with uh, Seth Green in this one. Especially since no one went to see it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> it's like... Just save your money, man. <laughs> um, that, that probably might have had something to do with why it was such a box office bomb, since they had to go back and re-record someone else into that role. That probably cost them a decent penny. Yeah. Got Joan Cusack as the mom, which is good casting. I love Joan Cusack. I'm always happy to see Joan Cusack pop up in something. Yeah. You have, um, so there's two people for Key. I'm assuming that Elizabeth Harnoy's 
if I'm saying that right, is the voice. And then the physical actor is, if you scroll down on this casting list, Eddie Patterson. Unless they, like, were... Unless they're... That's weird. I guess that that's another one um, where they got a different actor to do the motion capture, unless this is just wrong. Um, Eddie Patterson, I like her from, like... She's in Righteous Gemstone. She's the sister. I know you saw the, at least the first episode. Uh, yeah, it looks like Eddie Patterson is the voice and... Oh. The higher credited one, Elizabeth Harnoyce, is the physical actor. Interesting. Um, I don't know if that was deliberate or not. I like if there was like some Seth Green thing going on with that, or if it's so bizarre. I don't even get it with that one. I don't think either of those two names are like that big. Yeah, no. Seth Green has a big name, and even even the even him, I wouldn't call like a really big name. Like he is. It's just most people are at least somewhat familiar with Seth Green, but probably not everybody. <laughs> yeah, no. And, uh, yeah, I guess that's it, like, it for casting. Mindy Sterling as the supervisor. I think that's the woman from <laughs> iCarly, like the teacher. <laughs> I can't, I don't really recognize her. Yeah, else. yeah, it's, it's the teacher from iCarly. <laughs> yeah, she's doing all these alien, aggressive alien noises, respect. Yeah, I don't even think she spoke English at all yeah. in the movie. Yeah, it's just, maybe there was one part at the end where she did, I can't remember. Um, maybe, maybe. I want to talk about one scene in the movie, like, that, that I just thought was fucking ridiculous. And it's at the very end, when, um, you know, he, they rescue, Milo rescues his mom. And he, like, something happens to his helmet, yeah, he trips in the glass breaks. And then the mom puts her, takes her helmet off and puts it on him. And then that's like a scene, oh no, the mom's going to die because she's out in, in space without a helmet on. And then uh, Gribble, like the aliens are holding up a helmet to give Gribble and then Gribble's like, no. And then he runs past them to grab the helmet that he had for his mom all that time ago. Assuming that it still works after being out there for so long and also assuming that it would still be there just in general. After all those years without checking. And then he puts that one on. I feel like that's going out of your way to potentially kill this mother. Because <laughs> the aliens were literally right next to him. I know that they had to open a door or something. But I'm sure that would have been quicker than <laughs> what they did. And also, the, I mean, I, this is like what the point where I'm like criticizing animation logic. And that's going to make some people roll their eyes. But she would have definitely been dead by how long that took. Oh, yeah. No. There is, it takes they, them a they, long they... time to get that helmet on. <laughs> They they really don't understand how the surface of Mars works. Yeah, <laughs> in this movie. But he 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 risked the mother's life so he could be poetic. So there there is one cast member I think is worth mentioning. D. Bradley Baker is uncredited in this movie for making cat noises. <laughs> uh, D. Bradley Baker, of course, has is pretty well known for doing uh, a lot of animal noises. He's Perry the Platypus on Phineas and Ferb. Mm. And he is also uh, Momo and Appa yeah. from Last Airbender. And he also voices them in the movie Last Airbender. Uncredited. <laughs> so he has been... He has been in two movies for Hollow Victories and has not been credited in either of them. We gotta add him to the list. We're gonna credit him. <laughs> He's on. He's in the running for the king. Two uncredited roles. He is going to be in last. For Mister <laughs> D. Bradley Baker. He is going to be like the lat, like in last place on that list. But yeah, we're adding him. I'm looking at this other list of characters he did. Apparently, he did Squilliam. It's saying Squilliam Fancy Sin. Oh yeah, I believe it. Wouldn't it just? Why? I, I thought Squilliam Fancy Sin and Squidward had the same voice. <laughs> I guess not. Interesting. Does Klaus from American Dad? Um, he vo he voices the clones on the Clone Wars, mm. all of the clones. But I mean, he's he is a very, very prolific voice actor. Oh yeah, no. Uh, oh Waddles, we mentioned Gravity Falls earlier. A uh, lot of SpongeBob side characters. Yeah. Uh, he did do a meow for one of the snails in SpongeBob. He was that robot from Winnie Hut Junior. <laughs> All right, we should uh get back on topic. Uh, I guess in uh to sum up all of my thoughts on this one, it really isn't that. It's not like it's not that bad. It's not the worst thing ever made. It's just the problems that it have do hold it back a lot. Um, because like if you had these characters and good animation 
and the story stayed the same. I would say it's like maybe like a solid six out of 10. Like the story is still kind of a mess. The story, it could be better written. It is kind of weird how dark it gets. Uh, Not that I'm against dark stuff happening in a kid's movie, but it's just like, have a reason for it. Have like a good story if you're going to do that. Uh, The only way I would give it a six out of 10 is if it had like really good animation. That's what I'm saying. If they fix the animation up, like if it was... If if the animation was better, maybe a five, but I get I gave it like a four, so I'm kind of I'm kind of torn between a four and a five. I I think it's like because like, you know the music in the movie is also fine. It's not like yeah, no, this not... is by no means like a horrible movie. Um, it's it's not even like the worst Disney movie, despite yeah. it being their biggest box office bomb. Yeah, it's. Better than any of, like, uh, most of them, at least. It's better than most of the direct-to-video sequels and all that stuff. You know, it's better than uh, a lot of stuff that actually got released in theaters. I Let me think. I saw Toy Story 4. I liked this more than Toy Story 4, even though Toy Story 4 is, like, objectively a better-made movie. But I thought that that movie was, like... Rec- I, I thought I was really bored watching that movie. I thought it was just, like, more of the same shit when they already ended it properly, where this one's, like... There's some characters in here that I like. There's some... There's, it's not a joyless experience. Yeah, I definitely liked it more than, like, Cars 3. Yeah. <laughs> Never saw that um, one, but I'm sure. Don't! I'm sure. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't have, except my parent, my, my mom was paying. She's like, come on, let's go see Cars 3. And I'm like, fine. <laughs> and if, if I hadn't been there with family, I would have walked out. <laughs> yeah. I was so uninterested in that movie. Yeah, it, um, uh, the first one was enough for me to be like, okay, let's uh, keep watching these. <laughs> uh, anything else to say about Mars Needs Mounds? Uh, nope, not the not the worst thing ever, not very good. Belongs on the show. I agree. All right, would you like to introduce our second contender? Yes, so next up we have John Carter, released in 2012. It is a science fiction film directed by Andrew Stanton. A man who has a actually has a lot of experience with Pixar. He's even the director of Wally and Finding Nemo. Um, John Carter is based on a series of novels written by Edgar Burroughs titled the Barsoom series. I'm gonna mispronounce a lot of stuff. I wrote stuff down for this one because this movie's a, this movie was a mouthful. Um, and the intention with the John Carter film series was to do a trilogy, which fell through because, as we've mentioned already, a huge box box office bomb. Um, to talk about the story a bit. Uh, the abridged version. This film begins with a man named Edgar, who was named after the author of the books, attending his uncle's John Carter's funeral. John Carter's attorney gives Edgar his uncle's personal journal, which tells of his journeys to Mars and how he, along with a species, how he met a species known as the Tharks. Meanwhile, in a kingdom as he, known as Helium, the king of Helium is making his daughter Deja Thoris marry Slab. Than the Jeddak of Zodonga. I can't pronounce any of this shit. <laughs> you know, this is how I name shit. That's how I. This is how I go about it. In order to end a war that has been going on between Helium and Zonda- Zodagon, between Helium and the Zodagon army for a thousand years, John Carter, in his journeys, falls in love with this princess, and along with the Thark, stops the wedding and defeats the Z- Zodagon army themselves. John and Deja are married and, married, and then out of nowhere he is zapped back to planet Earth where he spends the rest of his life trying to get back, providing his nephew with the knowledge he will need to finish what he started. And then it turns out that was all bullshit and the movie ends. So the guy who wrote this, who wrote the book this is based on also wrote Tarzan. Oh. He wrote the original Tarzan book. That's cool. That movie did better with Disney. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a better Disney movie than so, this. So how do you feel about John Carter, Matt? Uh, I mean, <sighs> it's it's not horrible. It's not awful or anything. But um, I just incidentally, I watched this the same day I watched Dune. <laughs> so that was a, an interesting double feature. Um, and now you don't like Star Wars. And you said you weren't super into Dune. Mm-hmm. And I I said while we were watching this movie that I'm like, this must be how Michael feels for all of these movies because it's like okay things are happening, I I I understand the plot. There's good visuals. It's it's not like boring or anything, but like I am not interested at all. 
in what's going on. <laughs> can I can I give a really big hot take? Go ahead. I liked this more than Dune. <laughs> Dune looks so much nicer than this, and I think if you want to say it's objectively better, I would. I'm not even going to fight you on that. But I, my problem with Dune is my problem with a lot of these big sci-fi films where I just feel like it's just so expressionless, it's so bland. I, it's, like, really well-made, and I, I feel like I'm going to upset someone by saying that it's bland, but I just, every, every character plays it so straight-faced in that movie the whole time, and I got really bored. This movie has, like, I don't think this movie is great, and I think presentation-wise, Dune's much better. Um... But I just, I, I like some of the overacting. I really like William Defoe's alien character. <laughs> I like that dog character. I, I think that there, like, there are tons of characters that are straight-faced the whole time. But I think even then, like, John Carter himself, he's, like, almost kind of like an overactor in this movie. But it's fun. It's fun to listen to him talk. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. This is just kind of more up my alley, I think. I don't, I don't think it's... A great movie, but I certainly don't think it's a bad one either. I think its biggest problem is just, like, it's not really doing anything all that new. It's all stuff I've seen in different places just kind of merged together. But I uh, I had some fun watching it. Even though when I, I fell asleep last night because I was drinking excessively while watching it with you guys. <laughs> well, and then yeah, I watched the last 40 minutes. And even watching it alone and sober, I was enjoying myself. It's a long movie. Yeah. It was, it was past midnight where you are, right? <laughs> When we were done. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, one thing uh, that should be acknowledged, because yeah, this does feel real samey. It feels like there are a lot of other sci-fi movies that have done a lot of this. But it's probably worth noting that this is based on a pretty popular sci-fi novel that a lot of like popular sci-fi films have pulled from. Like Star Wars pulled heavily from this. Uh, from, from the books this was based on. So, some of that you can chalk up to, like, okay, well, this is based on the thing that everyone else has been ribbing for decades. But at the same time, like, you gotta put some sort of spin on it. You're just, you're just doing what those movies did again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another thing, it just feels... It, this came out... In sort of an era where Disney was doing a lot of PG-13 films. Like, PG-13 Disney films. Yeah. Um, and, and that worked for Pirates of the Caribbean. Pirates of the Caribbean was the first one, and it was excellent. Yeah. And I, after that, most of them didn't really work. And they all kind of have this same vibe to them. You know? Yeah. This, well, this feels very much in the vein of the other PG-13 Disney movies. With one big exception, which is that the characters in this movie bleed, except the blood is blue. I, this is just a weird trope in Hollywood. Red blood? That's bad. You can only, you only do a red blood in an R-rated movie. But uh, if it's any other color, that's perfectly acceptable. PG-13. You are absolutely allowed to have blue blood. Yeah, I was going to say, it's kind of funny because we did a, another movie we watched before this one, like a day or two before it was uh, The World's End. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, hmm, interesting. <laughs> do you think, do you think uh, the, the, what was it called, the, the Foundation, do you think they got to Mars before Earth? That's yeah. why everyone there bleeds blue? Oh yeah, that's probably what happened. That's the sequel to John Carter. It's just like how Split is the sequel to Miss uh, Unbreakable. It makes perfect sense. Absolutely. So I mean, it's it's a well shot movie. the The effects are pretty decent, although yeah, you know, it is a high budget Disney movie. So like, that's kind of to be expected. Like like, it would be worthy of criticism if the CG were bad in this movie. Um, I do like the alien designs in this one a lot more than I do <laughs> Mars Needs Moms. Um, oh yeah, I, th I think it looks very nice for out. Um, I liked, uh, I li yeah, I liked a lot of the sets, I liked a lot of the shots, I think the CG creatures, like, they didn't look real, but they looked good, they looked interesting, they looked, 
different from other things. I like the design of the dog. I like how dopey the dog looks. I, okay, I feel like I've seen something that looked a lot like the dog and something else, but I can't put my finger on it. Maybe I'm just thinking of this movie. Maybe I've just seen it in, like, clips or trailers from this movie, but the the dog looked a little familiar. Um, hmm. Although, speaking of the dog, we should mention the scene that made us all, like, lose it. Uh, the This dog is chasing John Carter as he's, like, hopping out <laughs> of this prison, and he hops into, like, the windowsill of this party, and so the dog runs into the party, and immediately the aliens start beating him up, and it's like, what the fuck? <laughs> the dog wasn't, like, again, the dog wasn't even doing anything. The dog walked in and started barking, and they're like, fuck this dog, and they start attacking it. And then John Carter, having a heart, had to put a stop to that. Yeah. <laughs> um... Wait, what the? Yeah, you posted that picture in the chat of everybody flipping off the dog. <laughs> there are some names attached to this, like big names attached to this film. Although weirdly, a lot of them are like voices, or or incredibly minor roles. Like like Brian Cranston is in like one scene. Oh yeah. Like at the very beginning, Brian Cranston shows up as like a cowboy, and you never see him again. He's a skeleton at the end. Is he? Yeah, he's like, he wakes up in that one place that he, like, got sent from, and he's like, uh, he looks around, and then <laughs> Brian, like, there's a skeleton in the corner where and what Brian Cranston was wearing. Uh, I think that was him. You... Maybe that was the thing. It might have been the person he killed, too. I think it was Brian Cranston, though. Um, you mentioned Willem Dafoe as one of the aliens, and he's real good. Yeah. Um, probably, he has a lot of, like, personality. He has, like, a bit of an arc in the movie. He's definitely one of the more likable characters. Um, the, the two leads of the film are Taylor Kitsch and Lynn Collins, uh, weirdly, both of whom appear in X-Men Origins Wolverine. <laughs> that is, like, the thing they are both most known for. Um, you got, uh, Thomas Hayden Church, who, uh, I think was also one of the aliens. Minor speaking role. The kid from Spy Kids, of course, was the nephew who's reading the story. Yeah. Um, Mark Strong is kind of like the main villain. Um, I thought that was Dominic West. He's sad well, fan. Okay, well, uh, okay. Dominic West is the guy that the female lead doesn't want to marry. Mm-hmm. Mark Strong is like this magic guy who can transform. Oh, and he's yeah. Like, and he's he's the one who like steals the amulet from John at the end and is the reason John is on the run at the end of the movie. So Yeah, yeah fair, I don't know. Kind, 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 I think it's fair to call him the main villain. Kind of a Darth Vader Emperor Palpatine thing there. Yeah, like if this was like the first, like if they actually made all three movies, you could argue he's the main villain of the series while Sabthan is the main villain of the first one. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I like Mark Strong. I'm happy to see him show up and Anything yeah. he does. Yeah, and he was fine, too. His dialogue was, like, really kind of... It, it, like, it felt... It, it might This might go directly with what you said of it being based on the book. His dialogue was really corny. Um, But it, like... Because it just... Only because it felt like you've heard it a million times before. Just stuff like, we do not cause the destruction. We simply manage it. Stuff like that. But it's just, like, if it was an early example of it, like, in the book. If that's a line from the book and it was written all that time ago, then I guess it makes sense to show it here showcase that dialogue here but uh i i enjoyed it um i enjoyed i enjoyed his character we kept i kept referring to him and his group as the boys they were all bald i don't even know why i was just i was just drunk talk john uh, favreau was in it briefly <laughs> yeah <laughs> very very minor character yeah just one of the folks in the bar at the beginning oh wait was that no was he somewhere else was he in the bar um, or am i thinking of someone else or actually I think you might be thinking of somewhere else, because, uh, yeah, John Favreau's one of the aliens. Yeah, never mind. Although, he easily could have been both. Yeah, I think I'm thinking of someone else, actually, but, uh, yeah. Um, anything specific you want to talk about the movie? Like, any scenes? We already talked about the dog getting flipped off. I messaged you about how funny I thought the death of one of the characters was. Uh, I don't know. I mean... I think it's worth mentioning that this movie is kind of all over the place. Yeah. 
because it, it starts out in the Wild West, and then he's on Mars, and he's getting along with these aliens, and then there's this whole other thing with these, like, two warring human factions, and then he goes back to the aliens from the beginning, and he has to deal with their new leader, and there's a big, like, Colosseum fight. Yeah, uh, the Colosseum which, fight almost felt like something that would be, like, more towards the beginning, you know? Yeah. That I strikes mean, me as, like, a weird climactic scene. It's not the climactic scene, but it's the last thing before the climax. Yeah, it well it reminded me a little of uh, the Colosseum scene from Attack of the Clones, and I, that you can't even be like, oh well, the book, because it's based on like Roman Colosseums, right? <laughs> like we already have sci-fi Colosseums. That's that's already a thing. <sighs> Jeez, I don't know. It's it's such a long movie, but like I I feel like I have significantly less to say about it than I did Mars Needs Mom. Yeah, uh, (laughs) I like the one scene I was talking about, just like sometimes it's like, I I do think for the most part, it's like, you know, it's kind of a mix of doing something dramatic and something lighthearted, like it does have comic comedy relief in it, it does have some weirder, like wackier characters to go with like the more straight faced ones. Um, But I do still think it has moments where it does something unintentionally hilarious. Um, there's that scene at, in the Coliseum after they defeat the white apes, which I like, the, that's another thing. I like some of the creature design in this movie. The white apes looked pretty good. They had, they, they were like these weird mole look, mole like creatures. But, uh, what's, what's the villain's name? Uh, one, it's another, like one of the film's antagonists who honestly is probably yeah. one villain too much. Cause it's like, you already have so much going on. Yeah. It's the like guy the guy who took the throne from Willem Dafoe. Dotar Sojats. But like, it's just like. He's, like, doing all of this talk throughout the movie. Then when it comes for him to actually, like, fight John Carter, they both jump at each other and then he cuts his head off within, like, two seconds. And it's just, he plops to the ground. It's almost, like, it's not supposed to be funny, but it almost has, like, comedic pace into it. Like, all right. And then, like, they're jumping, they're screaming, then, uh, it's just, it was. Yeah. Yeah. Feels like there was maybe supposed to be more to that, but... There's that thing that you commented at the end where it's like he's reading the book saying they might be, um, you need to, what was it? They're, they might be like trying to get to my body now as you're reading this. Yeah. And it's like, what if he, what yeah. if he like read it over the course of several days and not all at once? Yeah. Like maybe he had stuff to do that day and he was just like, all right, I'll read a couple. I'll read a little bit of it tonight. I'll read a little bit of it tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, like, maybe like, no... maybe start it with like, read this entire thing, please. Or maybe start it by saying like, Hey, I need you to go here real quick. Yeah, maybe maybe open with <laughs> I need you to go to the crypt as soon as possible. <laughs> I'll explain the the rest of the book will explain. <laughs> and then John Carter's just alive at the end of it. Yeah, well, he he, he said like he had the the poison that made it seem like he was dead, but he yeah. wasn't really dead. Yeah. But but also he wanted the amulet so that he could go back to Mars. Yeah. And and leave his like dead body locked in the crypt, his earth body locked in the crypt. Which that's something I'm not sure I understand. He his his earth body stayed on earth, but he had the same body on Mars because he could jump high on Mars and the the explanation for that is that like you know, gravity's heavier on Earth than Mars, so, you know, that, that explains his great jumping power on Mars. And you said it, and I was about to say it, it looks like uh, the Ang Lee Hulk when he starts jumping. <laughs> it, looks, it looks just like the scene from Ang Lee's Hulk. And I'm it like, does. You, it does. You said it, and I'm like, I was about to say that. I'm so <laughs> glad we were on the same page about that. <laughs> Like, it's, I, I don't understand why he has his Earth body on Mars if his Earth body's still on Earth. Yeah. It's not it's not like an Avatar thing, but it's kind of an Avatar thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I, I didn't really understand that either. I didn't really know what they were going for. I, I don't know. We I just yeah. kind of, like, dismissed it as weird sci-fi bullshit and chose not to think about it too hard. But uh, if if it was a movie that I liked more, I'd want to think about it more. But it's like it's as as far as it goes, it's just like yeah, it's fine. It's about the best I could say about it is it's fine. So when I notice stuff like that, I just kind of like shrug it off. Like what? Okay. 
That's a, that's the way I feel more of sci-fi than anything else. Oh, is that all we have for John Carter? Ah, uh, John but, Carter I, I, of Mars. Potentially, I don't. I feel like I, it's funny. I feel like we actually had less to say about this these two than I thought we would. But uh, yeah, I can't really think of anything else I want to mention about either either or. Um, I, I I did not dislike John Carter. I would even go as far as to say that I enjoyed it a decent bit. It's just not. I don't think it's great, but I think presentation wise, it looks nice. I think, you know, some of the characters are fun. I was not that invested in like the big war going on or the lore behind this world or, and if a sequel ever came out, I, which I know it's not, but I would not watch it. Like, <laughs> um, but it was fine. It didn't, it wasn't like a miserable experience. Dune, it, are we bringing that one back up? It's probably a better movie than this, but I was just really bored out of my mind watching Dune. That was my problem with it. Matt, say something nice about Dune now, so people who like Dune can not can go easier on me. I I really enjoyed Dune, uh, the movie. I I mean, it's it's exactly kind of what you want out of the uh, an adaptation of the book. My only real problem is I I think it was an odd place to end it, especially since I'm under the impression they were not guaranteed a sequel. I feel like you're risking like a uh, like a uh, Ralph Bakshi Lord of the Rings by doing that. But luckily the sequel's coming out. So as soon as the sequel's I mean the sequel might suck and then I might kind of think the whole thing is not as good, but right now I li- I liked Dune. I thought it was a good movie. Yeah, it, it'll at least definitely get its sequel. Uh as far Probably. as John <laughs> yeah, unlike John Carter. Yeah. As far as John Carter goes, I didn't hate it. It was a perfectly fine movie. Uh, I didn't think either of these films really deserved to be, like, biggest box office bombs of all time. Although, there's plenty of movies that were, like, bombs that are good. I think, technically, Shawshank Redemption bombed at the box office. Scott Pilgrim bombed, didn't it? Uh, maybe. Maybe. I thought I heard it did, but maybe I'm wrong. I think it got, like, a cult following, though. Yeah, just just because something didn't do well doesn't mean it's automatically bad. But these two did, like, so exceptionally poorly. Yeah. And then I've, I've never heard anyone try to defend either of them in the years since. Well, actually, that's not true. I have heard one or two people defend John Carter a bit. Yeah. I'll say this. Um, Something I forgot to mention about... John Carter that I just read in a, I was like looking up stuff about these two movies before, like as I was like writing my stuff up for my summary of John Carter and I saw a comment on like under a video about Mars Needs Moms where they said you want to see a good version of this movie watch Jimmy Neutron Boy Genius and I started thinking about it more and more I'm like yeah kind of yeah um, yeah kind of <laughs> the parents I don't know if it's Mars or not but the parents are being taken up from space the kid you know you have scenes where the kids are celebrating it for a little bit. Like, there's some fun scenes with that. Then there's, like, the theme park scene where they're, all the par- rides are turning to shit. Like, it's a movie, like, it's an old CG movie. It probably doesn't look that good anymore. <laughs> but it at least was cartoony and not, like, trying to be realistic like Mars Needs Mom. So it probably looks nicer. And then it's, like, uh, yeah, it's just, like, a more lighthearted, fun movie that... Yeah. It has a sense of humor about it, but still has the wholesome stuff with the family. So, yeah, it's, I would agree. I would agree with that statement that Jimmy Neutron Boy Genius is Mars Needs Mom's Done Right. <laughs> John Carter is just another sci-fi movie that apparently has the um, blueprints of a very beloved sci-fi story with the book it's yeah. based on. And I think they did an okay job. And I haven't read the book, so that could be another reason a lot of people don't like it, is they read the book and were disappointed yeah, by Yeah, I, I, I have heard... I have heard people defend uh, John the John Carter movie, but I've also heard people say like, "Oh, this is an awful adaptation of the book, and the book was so much better." And like, mm-hmm. and and it definitely feels like a very bland, very Disneyfied telling of the book. So yeah, like like without even reading the book, it it feels like this is probably not the best interpretation of this story. I think the blue blood thing, I know you already commented on that. I think that's just really dumb. Like, it's just, okay, like, what? Just, like, fucking t- both television movies with some of their rules on how they make something get by. Like, yeah, the, you can do blood, but it has to be blue. Like, why at that point? 
what is like like you're talking about a color and that's it why is the color the one thing that makes it okay i remember in fucking smiling friends there was like behind the scenes like zach was talking on like a podcast and they said like um satan smokes a vape in one scene and like the network some i don't remember who they were it's like some it's it wasn't even adult swim but someone behind the scenes basically said no yeah you know you can't have them smoking a vape we're really trying not to show that on television they're like okay what if it was like what if the smoke was red and it's like enchanted and they're like okay you can do that so like why why does changing the color suddenly make something okay i don't i don't get it i think it's stupid (laughs) yeah all right i guess it's time to move on to voting and i'm yeah honestly not sure which direction this is going yeah, I um, I know which one I like more, but I'm I'm not sure which one you're gonna pick. These are, I think they're both movies that are better than their reputation, but not especially good. Yeah. Um, I think you could make an argument that John Carter is maybe an objectively better movie, but if you ask me which one of these I wanted to watch again, like I have to watch one of these again, I'm gonna pick Mars Needs Moms because mm-hmm. it's just it's a lot more straightforward. Uh, it's it's faster paced. It's a lot more fun than John Carter. Like uh, I I feel like I would enjoy a rewatch of Mars Needs Moms more than a rewatch of John Carter. So I'm picking Mars Needs Moms. Mm-hmm. I kind of hear you if Mars Needs Moms. I think just length is a big part of it, where if you're watching two movies where you're like, oh, I don't think either of them are bad, but I don't love them, then if if that's your, if you're, like, so in the middle like that, I feel like you are probably just going to prefer the one that is shorter, <laughs> honestly, because it's less time you have to spend watching something that is, like, painfully average. I like John well, Carter a little bit more. Oh, go ahead. Even, even if Mars Needs Moms was longer, I think I would, or John Carter shorter, I feel like I would still go Mars Needs Moms over John Carter. Just okay. It, it, it just feels simpler, I guess. There's so much going on in John Carter, and I don't care about any of it. There's very little going on in Mars Needs Moms, and I care about some of it, but not most of it. Yeah. I, uh, I liked, uh, I, I think I like John Carter a little bit more, honestly. I, I just, like, I, I enjoyed the scenery. I there were some characters in there that I thought were stronger than the ones in Mars Needs Mom. Like I said, I liked I liked I think his name's Tars. I like William Defoe's character. Mm-hmm. Um, I like I like the sets. I thought there was like some fun. I just thought there were more fun ideas. I thought it got more creative than Mars Needs Moms. I think Mars Needs Moms is a movie that like is an easier watch for sure. But it's also just like I feel like it's it's not that original in a lot of its presentation. There's characters that are important that don't get focused on like the mom. And then John Carter just, it doesn't, it nothing about it, like especially stands out to me, but what they did with it, I think just consistently worked for what it was. Like I, I like, and I like some of the quirk that the movie has. I, like I said, I, th- I liked the dog. I liked the William Defoe character. John Carter wasn't, you know, he was kind of a blank main character. Like, there wasn't a lot to him, but I, I don't know. Something about the performance. He, he could have been a lot worse, honestly. Um, it was it was not a bad performance from him. Um, so I'm going with John Carter, honestly. All right. And that surprised me, too. I wasn't, after Mars Needs Mom, I was just immediately going like, okay, the next one's a sci-fi movie. It's Disney. It's two hours and 12 minutes. In my head, I was just immediately like, no, Mars Needs Moms, definitely. But nope, I'm, I'm actually surprised to say I like John Carter more. Oh, finally breaking our unanimous streak. <laughs> we we agree way too often. <laughs> yeah. But finally we disagree on one. Like, Although, wasn't Tank Girl the last time we disagreed? Uh, yeah, Maybe Rhapsody so. Street Kids. No, I think we agreed on Rhapsody Street Kids. I think the last time we disagreed was Tank Girl. <laughs> Damn. Um, wait, no, Serenity and Book of Henry. We disagreed on that one. I said oh. Serenity, you said Book of Henry. Oh, yeah, that's right, that's right. That was still, um, like, that was episode 5. <laughs> is this 10? Uh, this is episode 10. Hey, we made it to 10. It's double digits. <laughs> double digits. So, uh, the audience voted in favor of John Carter. Hey! By a, a pretty decent margin. It's 80 to 20 <laughs> out of 50 votes. So, uh, 40 people voted for John Carter and 10 voted for Mars Needs Moms. <laughs> But they all liked Dune too, so they're they're gonna still hate me. <laughs> all right, uh, I'm I'm willing to take the L on this one. 
Uh, John Carter wins. What is the like win to lose ratio? Like, how many more do I have than you, or how many more uh, than me do you have? You have only lost once. This is my second loss. Okay. Um, yeah, it's not, that's not bad. That's not bad. We normally, I, either we agree with each other or the audience is with us, but it's pretty, it's very often human, unanimous. You sent me like that list of how many times yes. <laughs> the different combinations we've had and unanimous is like six, like five or six in a row on that list. Yeah, uh, got one, two, three, four, five, six episodes where it's been unanimous out of 10. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what is next, Matt? All right. Well, I uh, it's it's been a little too long since I've like heard us, and I mean really heard us. <laughs> so, uh, to introduce these next two movies, I am going to employ a uh, a uh, an experimental communication technique known as referencing South Park. <laughs> Rob Schneider, whoop de derp oh, derp. It's the animal versus the hot chick. Oh, God. <laughs> They're at least going to be like an hour and 30 minutes, right? Like it's a Rob Snyder movie. They can't be too uh, I, I, I do think they're probably pretty short. If one of them is over... <laughs> if one of them is even approaching like an hour 45, that's too fucking long. Uh, <laughs> I, I had to do it to him. Yeah. Hour 24 and hour 44 for the hot chick. Oof. <laughs> it's going to lose just for being like 20 minutes longer. I'm You're calling gonna... it right now. We're going <laughs> to, the animal's going to win because that one's 20 minutes longer. <laughs> uh, All right. <God. laughs> Anything else? Um, fuck you. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> listen, listen, I'm watching Rob Schneider movies too. I know. We're I know. both in on this. No, it's okay. It's okay. I'm just saying you're Zachary only recommended Hubie Halloween that one time. <laughs> now you have two. Well, you have two back to back. I think that you're more evil than him now. Alright, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> no, it'll be fun. It'll be fun. We're gonna we're gonna talk about the Schneider. Uh not the Schneider cut, the Rob Schneider. The Rob Schneider cut. Yeah. <laughs> Release the Rob Schneider cut. Anyway, I want until the Rob Schneider cut. <laughs> until next time, uh, from my co-host Mackle Shadackle, I'm Matt Presents. Have a nice day. Peace.